All right, I'm presuming that this is actually working. I, uh, I had a little technical difficulty here. I, YouTube sometimes, when I open it up, everything is fine, and then I start streaming, and then it starts saying that there's like streaming errors, all of this stuff, and then I just restart my browser and it's good again. I don't know if that's uh, YouTube trying to get me to use Chrome or what, but welcome and thank you for watching. Today is episode 12 of the Sansible 101 live stream. Um, there will be still a few more episodes, and at the end of the episode, I'll, I'll get into what, I, what we'll do next. But um, <clears throat> today, we're going to talk about real-world Ansible playbooks. And I wanted to dive right in. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for uh, joining. And if you'd like, if you'd like to share uh, where you're from and where you're watching this live stream, that would be awesome. It's always cool to see where everybody is from around the world. In the past week, I've gotten a few emails from people from the Netherlands, which is near and dear to my heart, me being a gearling from the southern part of the Netherlands, not myself, but uh, two generations removed from that. And uh, But I've heard from people from India and from uh, the UK and from all parts of the US, Canada, Mexico, um, Brazil, all over the place. It's, it's really cool to see the global community we have and also to see some of the unity we have in the midst of all the difficult times we've been through in different parts of the world. So I started this series as we all kind of worldwide got into this difficult time with, uh, with COVID and, and I uh, will be continuing it for a few more episodes at least, but I, it's, it's really cool to see everybody come together. And um, another thing that I wanted to mention, uh, I'll, I'll switch to my screen share so you can see this. Um, Today is the last day. I'm going to close this contest, the entries for this contest. I set up a video a couple weeks ago for um, uh, a pay it forward challenge. So I, my YouTube channel has 25, well, now it has like 30,000 subscribers, which is crazy. Uh, I mentioned many episodes ago that my goal this year was to get to 5,000 subscribers, and that kind of got blown away. So that is, uh, I'm floored by that. Thank you very much for subscribing. If you are subscribing, if you don't, you can go ahead and click subscribe below. There's plenty of good content coming. Uh, but today is the last day that you can donate to an open source project or maintainer and get a chance to win this Raspberry Pi 8 gigabyte uh, Model 4, which is brand new unopened. I have, I have a, well, I don't know where it is. Here it is. I have another one that I've been testing. I'm going to be doing a full review on it. And yesterday, in fact, I worked entirely from the Raspberry Pi all day. Um, and I'll share my thoughts on that in a video coming very soon. Uh, but if you're interested in that, like I said, subscribe to the channel. Lots of good content coming there. Also talking about the Turing Pi cluster and how I'm using Ansible with Kubernetes to control that. Uh, it's over on the other side of the room, so I can't grab it to show you it. Um, but anyway, there's, there's that. And uh, it's been really cool to see. I think we're past $10,000 raised for different open source projects. And a lot of them, like there's a few people who donate to GIMP and to the Apache Foundation, things like that. Every organization that does open source work always needs the help. But it's been especially awesome for me to see some of the donations people, you know, if you, if you give somebody three bucks or five bucks or a dollar and for a small open source maintainer, especially if they might just be starting out and you use something that they did, uh, or even if you don't use something they did, but you saw a blog post that you liked from them or something, it it can really make their day. So I'm I'm happy to see that. Um, so go ahead and do that if uh, if you're inclined. You don't even have to enter the contest if you don't really want to win the Pi Four, but it is pretty cool Raspberry Pi. Uh, spoilers for the next video. Um, let's see. So I also wanted to thank uh, these new sponsors so much. I I said in the last video like. I guess I didn't make it explicit enough. I didn't want people to give to me. I wanted people to give to other open source maintainers because I've I've been extremely blessed this whole time during during uh, the the lockdown that we've had, staying at home. Uh, I already was well set up for it. Uh, my job, I've I haven't had any real uh, concerns there, and so you know I, I really wanted to try to pay it forward to other people. But there are some people who have been uh, starting to support me, which is awesome. And I've, I've mentioned on my GitHub sponsors page, my goal is if I can get uh, $1,000 a month in sponsorship, I'll be able to dedicate a certain amount of time each week to my open source work and these videos and things like that. At, at this point, I'm not to the point where I can make this a sustainable long-term thing, but if I can, that would be awesome, and I would love to do that. Uh, so this week, uh, Saibat Carol Chen, um, who I actually work with sometimes at Red Hat, um, thank you very much, Mozilla99. Nord, Nordl, Nord 3L, uh, Frankie Gravato, I like the name Cron Parser, 
uh, Vlad Volkov uh, from Kiev, Marco from Brussels, and three other private sponsors, uh, Wycombe Seelig from Patreon, Bartles, John Randy, Eden, Eden, Eden uh, Joseph Gutworth, uh, Ankur Shah, Marcel Hoffman, Wesley Wilson, Ajmal Mah- Mahmood. It was funny, I, I knew somebody uh, with the last name Mahfood, and so when I, when I saw this, I was like, oh, he must be, nope, he's not related, it's Mahmood, a little different. Sam Barons and Alex Haydock. I think I might have gotten those names correct this week. If you're on and you saw my name and I butchered it, sorry about that. Um, but uh, as I mentioned with other episodes, the I, I love doing these live. It's it's a little more stressful because I have to do a little more prep work, and I you can't. Uh, on on one of my Drupal live streams, I actually took down my production website during the live stream. That's always fun to do, and uh, it's. It, I've mentioned that my brain is in a different mode when I do a live stream versus doing a pre-recorded thing. Uh, it's it, like when I'm doing pre-recorded stuff, I have a little bit more time to think. I can also go back and redo something. Sometimes it's annoying to do that and it takes longer, but um, that way I can I can be very precise. In a live stream, it's, it's a lot different. And sometimes my brain slips out of like the remember to do this in this mode or the debug mode and I miss something. So the live chat has been totally awesome. Uh, please keep that up. Uh, and um, if I say something wrong or if I say something inadequate or if somebody has a question that I don't see, please feel free to, to uh, mention that. Bilal says, uh, write some AI to, that detects when you switch your focus and the camera view changes. And that was in response to my new wide angle camera that I have over here, which I just am realizing it's not quite aligned correctly, but uh, that's okay. I also have a center camera, but I, I haven't set that one up yet, so can't see that one, unfortunately. Don't think I haven't thought about doing this. Uh, that might be a topic for a new video sometime. There are commercial systems that do this, and it's actually kind of cool. Um, I'm thinking about doing some Raspberry Pi camera projects. After using the Pi 4 for a day, I found some interesting things that I could do with it, and uh, we'll see. We'll see about that. I know it was probably in jest, maybe. Uh, but it, it's actually an interesting proposition. Uh, Iman Hamid said, uh, in Ansible Tower workflow template, we use parent credentials. Uh, so there are a lot of things. In the Ansible Tower demonstration I did, I think, two weeks ago, there were a lot of little things that I went through that are that's like the super beginner way. And as you get into Tower, you realize there's a lot of efficiencies you can get, um, like workflows and uh, templates can have surveys. And there's a lot of different things you can do to make it more optimal and easier to maintain and easier to add new jobs and things. So that's one of the things is uh, credentials can be um, uh, can be inherited by job templates so that you don't have to deal with adding the, the credential to every, every one of your job templates. Uh, which tower version was I using? I was using AWX 11.2.0. Uh, AWX 12, I think, was just released like yesterday. And it has some big changes. It's using Redis instead of Memcache. Uh, well, it, it dropped Memcache. I don't know if it's using it instead, but it now has Redis and not Memcache and not um, Rabbit MQ. And it, it's a pretty big architecture shift. So uh, the other thing is that ADBX now uses one Docker image for both of the web and task containers. So that's a nice efficiency there. You don't have to download two container images every time you want to run it. Um, then uh, Jim Dumser and Stephen Tooley, if you're on, hi. Uh, I am in not the Metro East. I'm in South St. Louis. Uh, I won't give my specific location because that would be silly. Uh, but I'm, I'm in the St. Louis area, and so it's always cool to see some other St. Louis people, especially since the Midwest is not super techy. Um, we have, we have our, our highlights, um, and it, we actually have an Ansible meetup that usually has 30 to 40 people at it. Haven't had it in a few months, of course, but... Uh, but uh, hi from, from anyone in St. Louis. Uh, Hans says, why not multiple organizations in AWS? That was in response to me having a bunch of AWS accounts. The problem is that I, uh, one of them is for a, my work entity. One is for my personal entity. entity. One of them is for the book, which um, I could put in the work entity, I guess. Another one is for uh, a business that I run that I want to have independent in case I want to branch it out someday. I've said that since 2008, so what are we? It's more than 10 years since then, and I haven't done it. So maybe I should just kind of branch it back in. But anyways, um, yeah, that's a good way to optimize your your spending, your tracking, your billing, and all that stuff. Uh, 
you can add uh, an AWS plugin config from the project instead of using the UI. Uh, this is true. Another optimization you can do in Ansible Tower, uh, Smart Inventory. Uh, you can do that as well. Uh, there's a lot of things in Tower that you can do basically that I did not cover at all in my one hour talking about it. Um, uh, the UI needs a .ini file for uh, the raw inventory files, I guess, but I can type in the path. I think I found that when I was doing some testing after I did the episode. So as I said, there's a lot of things I didn't cover in, in uh, Tower and AWX. Um, why is there a transparent part in the GitHub logo? Yeah, I, I actually noticed that. I, I never saw that until um, until Michael or Michal, I don't know how to pronounce that, um, mentioned it. There's If I move over here, you can see there's there's a little trans transparent part in here, and it looks really funny. So maybe I'll fix that someday, or maybe not. It's it's one of those things that I'll probably forget about it the second I'm done with this. Um, you bought a hard copy of the book on Amazon. How can I get an update copy? Anybody who's ever bought my book, if you want a copy on LeanPub, email me, and I will send you a coupon code to grab a free copy. Um, yeah, so I... I I really don't want somebody that paid money for my book to not be able to get the latest updates. I wish that Amazon had a way. I think they have like a Kindle match thing where it's two bucks or something. You can get the Kindle version if you bought a hard copy. I wish they just said, you buy the book, you get a copy. <laughs> you, get a, you get an ebook copy. It's ironic that Amazon has the worst um, book update mechanism that I've encountered out of all the publishing groups that I've worked with. But I, you know, they might have kind of a monopoly on it, so maybe that's why. Anyways, um, any inventory management type of software packages? Uh, there are a lot of different ones. So CMDBs uh, track servers, basically, and lets you, lets you plug Ansible into them so that you can see them. Um, if you're all inside AWS, then you could use AWS plugins like EC2 to, to get your inventory. But most people are not entirely inside one cloud provider that can work with Ansible that way. So you might need something like that. Um, there's a lot of different inventory systems out there. Device42 is one who sponsored some of these videos and the free books that I gave away in March and April. In April. And uh, I invite you to check them out too. Um, Norman says, I look like Stephen Locker in South Africa. I tried to find who Stephen Locker was, but I could not. So uh, if, if anybody wanted to link me to who that is, it would be fun to see if I actually do look like them. Someone on YouTube commented, I look like Steve Buscemi or Buscemi. I don't know how to pronounce his name. I guess that's when I do my, my YouTube thumbnails and I'm like that and kind of stuff. The annoying thing is, so YouTube thumbnails. Sorry to go on a tangent. Uh, if I don't do that, I have empirically found that, that I get a much lower click-through rate and a much lower uh, amount of watch time for my videos so yes, I also hate YouTube face that, you know, people are making stupid faces and smiling and things. But if you do that, you get more views and more revenue and more subscribers, which on, on one sense, like you have optimization for, uh, this is a big debate in our tech community. You have optimization for engagement, but that's not always a good thing. Uh, however, if you don't have eyeballs, if you don't have viewers, then, you know, if you're not increasing your rates and things, then, uh, how are you going to have a sustainable future in, in what you're doing? So it, it's it's one of those things I hate it, and uh, most people do, especially tech people, because it's really stupid looking and dumb. But it, empirically, it it works. So that's I'm I'm not going to go too far into uh, territory of being a stupid annoying YouTuber. I hope, but uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Let's get on to real world Ansible playbooks. <laughs> Somebody says hey. Steve Buscemi after getting some rest. Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. I, th I think it's the eyes. I, it's something that uh, some of the Gearling family has uh, are, for some reason, the bottom eyelid kind of has a, a little bit of a more definition to it. And I think that's what I share in common. I don't know. All right. Uh, so we'll get into real world Ansible playbooks. And I just so happen to have today uh, the same playbook that killed my production server live a few weeks ago on my Drupal live stream, and we'll, we'll see if it happens again today. I figured that why not take the risk and uh, uh, see if we can blow things up at the beginning of the live stream. Last time it was at the end of the live stream, so I was like, uh, okay, I gotta go, and then I fixed it. If we can blow it up at the beginning of this live stream, that would be even more fun. So um, this is, uh, what is this? I, I put in a, a comment here because I 
it's kind of this way. Uh, this server has been around, let me see, git log. Uh, let me go back. It's been in git since 2015, but I believe that this configuration, I, I didn't have all my Ansible playbooks in git initially. I think I started on this one in 2013 or 2014. So this particular playbook has been around since 2014 or so. Um, and uh, it, it's it's gone through a lot of different phases. And there's a saying that in a shoemaker's house, the shoe always has a hole. This playbook doesn't follow every best practice. It doesn't follow all of the things that I've learned over the years. And part of that is because it's been running constantly for years. And uh, its target is one DigitalOcean virtual machine. It used to be on Linode, I think, originally. Then I moved to DigitalOcean sometime in 2015 or 2014, maybe. Um, and it's been on there since, but I've, I've migrated to uh, a couple times when I do OS upgrades. Instead of just upgrading in place, I, I migrate to a new VM entirely. Um, and I still don't use, I don't have a, uh, what is it, a persistent IP or whatever DigitalOcean calls it, an elastic IP, basically. I don't have one of those. So every time I do this update, I have to plan it out and I have to, um, I have to set up uh, uh, like a... Um, uh, a, a, like a load balancer in front and then I, I kind of put it up uh, a week beforehand and then I move my DNS to that load balancer or the just a proxy basically because it's just one server it's not balancing anything and then I move my server on the back end and then I take away the proxy after I see that the DNS requests are all going to the new IP so it's it's kind of annoying and kind of silly um, but as I said the uh the shoemaker's house, uh, the, the children don't wear shoes or whatever you want to call it. Someone mentioned the builder's house is never finished. Um, at some point, and part of the problem is I have, I, I started with like eight Drupal sites that were all running on one server. And I've slowly whittled it down. I'm now down to three Drupal 7 sites and one Drupal 8 site. I have a Kubernetes cluster that I'm working on to host all of my miscellaneous junk, including my static sites and my Drupal sites and all that. So at some point I'm going to move this all in there, but... Uh, that's all, that's like down here on the list and my like paying work is up here. Family is, I guess family is a little bit higher than that. And then all these like YouTube stuff is here. So we'll see if that ever happens. Um, but this is the playbook. It's, it's pretty simple. There's some variables it loads. Uh, I just do everything as sudo because that makes it easier. I always get my sandwich. Um, Let's see, there's there's a few little preset up tasks. There's all the Ansible roles that I run uh, to configure all the different services on the server. And then I have, this is basically where the important stuff happens. Once once it sets up all the, all the different configurations for a, a LAMP stack server, uh, there's a deployment, uh, a deployment task include here. And I put a tag deploy because 99% of the time when I run this playbook, all I want to do is run some deployment tests. I want to update something on the server. So if I go to uh, tasks deploy, I'll show you how that works. Um, there are uh, two folders for Drupal sites. There's a Drupal 7 folder and a Drupal 8 folder. And it just makes sure those folders exist. It checks out the code base. Uh, for Drupal 7, it's a little different. I, I never automated the Drupal 7 deployment. So what I do for that is I act, I literally go in and like click around on the interface, which I tell people never to do because that's stupid, but I do it anyways. Um, so I never really automated that. But after the live stream, I realized I should probably automate it with Drupal 8 because Drupal 8 has a few more steps involved. And I didn't want to, every time I deploy my site, I didn't want to have to go in and do those by hand. Uh, so with a Drupal 8 deployment, it, uh, it deploys new code. And right now I'm tied to the master branch. That's just because this is a personal project. Again, I would never recommend that you just deploy master production all the time unless you're way ahead of most people in terms of the, the ability to always have an integrated and working master branch. You should usually use tags, and the tags should be tested, and the, the tags should be intentionally deployed. But I'm just using master because this is my personal site, and if it's down for a few minutes, it's not the end of the world. Um, anyway, when it's deployed, it registers, um, it registers this variable, and when this is changed, I use a block. I think I talked a little bit about blocks, but it's kind of like a lightweight way to have a group of tasks. There's a couple different things you can use blocks for. In this case, instead of doing an include file and having this stuff right here in a separate file, I wanted it in line. So I just put these three tasks in a block and then the block has one win condition. So whenever this 
uh, whenever this uh, task up here results in a change, it will run this block of code. Uh, there's another purpose for blocks, and that's to have uh, block rescue and always to the, to the point where in line in a playbook, you can have some tasks. If one of them fails, it'll go to rescue and it'll do some other things. So like if you deploy and the deployment fails, you can in the rescue condition. So that would be like under here, rescue. Uh, you can have a task like name rollback deployment, something like that to make sure that your system gets back into a proper state. And then you can also have an always section. Um, and that would be you know, notify somebody of, of what happened or whatever. And that would always run whether or not the block uh, succeeded. Uh, but in my case, I'm just using this kind of like an inline include because uh, I wanted to have a win condition on these three tasks. And it's easier to do this once than to have it on all three of these tasks. So if that happens, then uh, it has to make sure that there's a directory that's writable. Otherwise, Drupal will fail with its updates. And then it uses, uh, in PHP, the dependency manager is called Composer. So when I update the code, I want to make sure that all the dependencies my code uses are up to date. So it does a Composer install in the web directory. And then it runs some commands that uses Drush's auto, or Drupal's automation utility, Drush, to clear caches, um, import any new changes, and update the database if there's any database schema changes to be made. So again, this is if if you're dealing with a production website that you're revenue dependent on this is not the best way to do a drupal deployment or most php applications are similar because this could result in some downtime while it's doing these operations uh, so it, it's better to do something else i'll talk about it a little bit later some of the other ways that you can do this but i do have i do have a code change that's ready to deploy um, I, I uh, updated one of the modules on the site. I think, uh, let me go to jeffgearling.com, go to available updates, and Drupal has a module update available for Search API Solar. My site uses uh, host, or it, it uses a Apache Solar for search. So if you search for Ansible, it's going to um, use Solar to find that content and give you facets for sorting and stuff. It's pretty cool. And that's uh, one of the things I do like about the Drupal ecosystem is the solar and search integration support is really awesome uh, for content-based sites. Anyway, so that module has an update. And uh, earlier this morning, I went to my code repository, which is entirely open source. So if you ever want to see how my website's built, uh, you can go here. I, I guess I didn't submit a PR. Again, the cobbler doesn't uh, do the right thing all the time. Uh, the... Yeah, I just pushed to master on this, and uh, it just updated the module, and the changes are in the composer.lock file. So what this will do is it'll push up some new code that says, hey, my dependency bumped from version .0 to .1, and then this deployment code will run, and it'll make sure that the in this composer install step, it'll make sure that it updates that dependency, and then it runs these standard tasks to make sure that everything is running correctly afterwards. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. Um, and like I said, uh, I made some changes to this file. Let me make sure I undo anything. Okay. Uh, so like I said, I put a tag on this. That way, when I'm running this playbook just to deploy changes, I, I don't really need to reconfigure Git because I know Git's running fine. I don't need to do any PHP updates. I do that separately. I have a weekly job that makes sure PHP and MySQL and all that are up to date. Uh, so I just want to do the deploy. So I put a tag on this uh, include here so that I can just say, run the playbook with just the deploy tasks. And I think uh, there's, a, there's a couple other tasks that have tags always. If you ever put, this is a special tag, the always tag. These tasks will always run no matter what other tags you specify. So there's some things you might always need to do, like gathering facts or, or getting some data out of an external system. And things elsewhere in the playbook would fail without them. Uh, so you, you always want to make sure that those tasks are tagged with always. And it's pretty apparent if you don't have them tagged that way, you'll, you'll find out pretty quickly. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say Ansible playbook. And it's funny too, you can tell my, my older playbooks, around 2016 was when I started switching from using playbook.yaml to main.yaml. So if you ever see my Ansible content and you see a playbook.yaml, you know I probably set that up before 2016. Nowadays, I always call it main.yaml. Some people say site.yaml for the full everything playbook, but uh, I'm just using playbook.yaml. Uh, so I'll do playbook.yaml dash dash tags uh, deploy. 
and that should just hit these two tasks, which it's doing right now. And then it's going to go into the deploy.yaml and everything should be fine. And then it updates the code base and then it sees that there's a change that's going to run this block right here and it's gonna run these commands. So it's doing cache clear, then cache rebuild, config import, and update DB. It did all that, and let me make sure the site is still up. It is, so that's good. And then if I go to available updates now, if I go down here, it should say that it's up to date. Yeah, search API Solar 411, up to date. <clears throat> so that's successful. And that's a real world, I mean, that's a pretty simple playbook. There's obviously things go a lot more complicated than a single server LAMP stack for a Drupal site like I have here. Uh, but it's that's a demonstration of a playbook that I started in 2014 and it's still around today. And uh, I, you know, if, if I go to server check-in and uh, well, I, I don't remember my login for it right now, but if I go there, I, the uptime for jeffgaling.com has been 99.99 nine something for years it's, for a lot of applications out there you don't need anything more complicated than that and like for my site I'm, I'm okay with having a minute or two of downtime when this runs so simplicity for me is more important than having a super robust deployment system that has a load balancer multiple servers everything is up all the time and i have caching in front of it like that stuff doesn't matter as much to me i, I did set up nginx to cache html responses so if it's just a basic web page that somebody's hitting, they should hit that cache during the time that this might be down for a minute or so. But uh, it's all a trade-off between simplicity, complexity, and what you're willing to maintain. And I guess the moral of that story for me is sometimes when I get into an enterprise project and somebody's asking for three load balancers and two regions and four failover zones and all, you know, it's like, are you asking for that out of a need? or out of something where your applications have been failing, or you're asking for it because you saw it in a webinar and some company did some amazing thing, or you saw that Netflix, which is like all the bandwidth on the internet, a company that big has this problem and you want to apply it to your company, which has this teeny tiny little problem on this teeny tiny little application. Maybe there's a better way for you to do it. Um, I don't know. Uh, Drupal 8 is a pretty resource intense application in my opinion. And it's been running fine with this simple setup. And I have a lot of uptime. And I, if I wanted to, I could just have a spare server that I could switch over to if I needed to. And uh, sometimes people add a lot of complexity for a very small gain. Or in fact, you add a lot of complexity and then you have a complex system, which is almost impossible to manage. So always, always fight that battle of, am I adding complexity where complexity is not actually needed because it makes the system harder to maintain? All right, so that's my site. Um, I'll exit out of there. Uh, going a, a small step uh, further, I'm going to look at one of the examples in the book, and I'm actually going to look in the book. I forgot to mention, here's my book, Ansible for DevOps. Most of the people watching the stream probably already know that, so I won't get into it. But um, I'm looking at an, at an example in Chapter 9, uh, Deploying to App Servers Behind a Load Balancer. And this is extremely common. If, if you're using, even if you're using something like Kubernetes, it's good to have an understanding of how a rolling deployment like this would work, where it deploys, it updates one thing, takes it out of the load balance or out of the service balancer, then it uh, puts it back in when it's healthy, then it takes out another one, and then it puts it back in when it's healthy, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of different ways to manage that, depending on if you're in AWS and you're using um, ELBs or ALBs or NLBs. If you're in Google Cloud and using the Google's balancers, if you're using HA proxy on your own, if you're using Varnish, if you're using Nginx, whatever the system is, uh, you have to be able to manage uh, the, the whole process of the update. Um, let me, uh, oops, I clicked on the wrong thing on my other window and now, now I can't see myself to make sure that I'm actually in the stream. All right, uh, so anyway, I'm gonna look at this example it, uh, someone mentioned a few weeks ago, are you going to start using Vagrant again? I was like, yeah, this is tricky because it, you know, the CPU kind of, I found out that OBS, the streaming software I use, actually go, it increases in CPU load throughout the course of the stream. So by the end of the stream, there's a lot fewer resources for the poor computer. If you listen closely in the background, you can probably even hear the fans are already turning pretty, uh, pretty loudly, uh, but I'm, I'm going to use this Vagrant uh, configuration just because it's it's quick and easy and I don't have to spin up instances in AWS and 
make sure to tear them down later so I don't get billed two bucks for the month or however much it'll be. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and run these. It's gonna set up a load balancer server and then two app servers. And this, th these aren't gonna be running real applications at this time, I'm just illustrating with this example. Uh, but th the idea here is that the load balancer will be in front of the two app servers. All requests and all traffic go to the load balancer and then it, and it uh, says, okay, app one is healthy, so I'm gonna send a request to it. App two is healthy, I'm gonna send a request to it and keep doing that. And it's gonna use round robin using HAProxy. And then when we do a deployment in a couple minutes, let me go ahead and start uh, Vagrant up so that this can run. When we do a deployment after this, uh, what the deployment will do is it will use Ansible's serial feature. Uh, you can tell a play to use a serial number, like not a serial number, like on a box of, of uh, serial, <laughs> uh, not on the, not that kind of serial number, uh, like a number of zero. Well, you can't do zero because that would do nothing. One to infinity, however many servers at a time you want the play to run on, so that you could have it um, run on one server or two or three servers at a time. Take them out of the mix, do a deployment, do the updates on them, and then put them back in the mix, and then go to the next set, take them out of the mix, update them, put them back in the mix, that kind of thing. So uh, it's going to bring up those three VMs. It'll be running Ubuntu 18, I think, and uh, the playbook that it runs is this provision playbook. It's extremely simple, and for like I said, it, it, your application might not be super complicated. This is setting up a, a, a load balanced server setup with, with two backend servers. For a lot of applications, this might be all that's needed if you want to have high availability and have the ability to have one server go down or, or manage one server at a time, that kind of thing. Um, I think somebody somebody mentioned in the, in the uh, comments, uh, what was it about managers? Clustering is sexy and managers gullible. Yeah. So, so it, I don't know. I, I always try to fight for what's simple more than what's complex, unless the complexity is absolutely worth it. Um, but anyway, this is going to set up HA proxy on the first server, and it's going to tell it that there's two backend servers, and it's going to serve traffic through port 80, which is HTTP. And then on the two backend servers, the app servers, they're just going to run Apache, and it should just load up the, the default Apache welcome page. Uh, so once this comes up, we should be able to load it. And uh, let me look at my notes here in the book. Uh, there's, we can use curl to check uh, what cookie is set by HAProxy because HAProxy will set a cookie with the, the server that it's uh, pulling the, the page load from and it should be round robin. So it should be going from dot three to dot four to dot three back and forth. Uh, so we'll check that in a second and let me make a new, new tab here. So this is still installing Apache on the two servers. Uh, but the command is four I in one dot dot do curl dash is to return cookies http slash dash 192.168.4.2 is the load balancer grep cookie done uh, so we're going to do that command in a second okay so that's working and just to show you what it looks like uh, this is the load balancer if I go there, I should be getting the default page. And if I refresh it over and over and over again, it's just giving me the default page, but it's going to both of the backend servers, which are dot four, dot three, and dot four, not dot 34, dot four. So these are both serving the same thing. But if we use uh, curl, yeah, what a, uh, oh, <laughs> not an in, there we go. So you can see, that the first page load was dot three, second one was dot four, third one was dot three, dot four, dot three, back and forth. And if I keep doing that, it should be doing the same thing. Now I'm gonna go ahead and run a deployment. And yeah, someone said you did in for, for I in. Maybe I'm thinking of trying to go out of my house and visit anywhere on the planet right now, but I'm still, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I have Crohn's disease. So I'm on two immunosuppressant drugs and I am, a week or two before everyone officially announced lockdowns, I was pretty much on lockdown because I, I don't want to deal with uh, the potential downsides to getting uh, COVID. So anyways, um, yeah, I would love to go to an inn someday. Uh, this year is my wife and I's 10th anniversary. And I'm thinking like we were planning on going on a trip and now we're thinking like, well, we could like order some food from somewhere. <laughs> it's a lot different. Um, anyways, Let's see, uh, this deployment is going to 
uh, when I run the playbook, it's going to take the server out of HAProxy and uh, it's going to use Ansible's HAProxy module for that. And this is, this is one good case of where uh, most load balancers actually have a module for Ansible so that you can just take a server out like this. It's really easy this way. If it didn't have this, I'd have to run a command or do something else inside of the server, uh, and it, it would be a little harder to maintain and make that item potent. However, um, it's not. If you look at the HA proxy code, it's not the most complicated module in the world. And if if your system doesn't have a module for it, then you could probably write an Ansible module for it to make it this simple in the future. Uh, but it's going to disable the backend server, uh, and this is even set up so it, right now the the balancer. If I look at the inventory balancer, is just one server. The way this is set up, if you had multiple load balancers running, uh, which you can do with like round robin DNS or something like that. If you had multiple balancers, this would still work with that too. It would disable the server in each of the load balancers. After it finishes doing that, uh, this is where there would be a deployment. So you would update the code on the server. You would run other updates, whatever you needed to do on the server, like what I was doing with the Drupal site. Uh, once that's done, uh, maybe it's just copying files or something. After that's done, which I put in a, a pause of 10 seconds, uh, then it's going to use Ansible's wait for module to make sure that the service on that server is back up and running. Uh, it, it's often good to do this. So instead of just doing a deployment and thinking, okay, it worked, and then moving on and putting the server back in the mix, this is gonna make sure that the server is actually responding on port 80. So uh, it's always better to, and this, this goes back to the, the episode I talked about testing. This is an inline test that makes sure my application is running correctly. It'd be even better if I checked, like if this is a website that has uh, content on it, check that that content actually exists on the page. And you can do that also using, I think, the URI module and using an until retry loop. Uh, so anyway, it's going to wait for that to come up. Then it's going to use HAProxy and put the server back into the mix. So I'm going to go ahead and run this deploy playbook in here, uh, Ansible. Let me make sure you can see that by putting it above YouTube's playhead. Ansible playbook, uh, and then it's dash i inventory. Uh, what is this playbook? Playbooks slash deploy. So it's going to run this. And while it's doing this pause, I should see over in here that it's sending all requests now to one of the two servers. So right here, it's operating on, on the uh, dot three server, and it took it out of the mix and it, it switched all traffic in HA proxy over to that four. Now that it's finished with the playbook and it put it back in the mix, and then it took out dot four, I should see that all requests are going to dot three. So right now, the, the, and it must have just finished because it's now distributing requests again. So that's a super simple way if you're using HA proxy, but other load balancers are similar. One nice thing about HA proxy is it has a really good API for letting you control all these different things compared to like if you use Nginx Community Edition, the open source version, there's no way to, to put servers in and take them out the same way that you can here that I did with, with HAProxy. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's one way to get complete zero downtime deployments. Uh, and if, if I wanted to, I could take my, my Drupal playbook and I could have three servers instead of one, and I could have it do that kind of setup and I could take away that risk of having a minute or two of downtime, or on that live stream, it was like seven minutes. So um, I could take away more of that risk by doing this, uh, because what could happen too is if the deployment does fail, and I'd, if I don't have a robust block with a, re or with a rescue statement in it, if it takes that server out and then it fails the deployment, then it could just fail it, and it would be out of the mix, and then I could go in manually and fix that server and then bring it back in the mix later. Uh -huh. All right, so that is that. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I'm going to delete this uh, vagrant destroy because I don't want to have a bunch of extra VMs running on my machine. Not while the CPU is slowly increasing. You can see OBS is up to 272.8%. I did a two-hour live stream a couple days ago, and OBS got up to 680%. And uh, I think the, the temperature was up to 99 or 98 or something like that, Celsius. And... Uh, I am American, so 98 degrees Celsius is 208 Fahrenheit. That's pretty darn hot for a computer to be running. Uh, so the fans are on full blast. Oh, and apparently when I do Spotlight, it shoots the uh, CPU up to 100% on all cores. All right, so yeah, uh, oh, I should have done, oh, what is it doing? Destroy dash F, just delete them all. And then I'm gonna switch over now 
uh, actually, I'm, I, I put a note in the book so I wouldn't forget to mention it. Um, you also saw that I had, uh, in my playbook, I just, I had it do it in place. And part of the reason for the downtime is that when you do operations to code that's running in production in place, when you change that code, there's going to be brief moments where the PHP interpreter is going to be like, uh, the, the file I'm using just went away or the file I'm using just changed right out from under me while I'm doing this page request. So you're going to get uh, failures and things like that just from that. Uh, so in the Ruby community, at least, uh, there's a tool called Capistrano. Uh, Capistrano. And I believe Capistrano Ansible. I believe there's even a, is there a module for it? I don't, there, there's, there was something in Ansible that integrated with Capistrano directly. Uh, but Capistrano is a way to do deployments on servers with uh, better better availability, where it, it kind of like makes a copy, it does things to it, and then it switches from one copy to the other so that it's it's a little quicker and, and faster and better. Um, but if you're interested in it, and there's, uh, I forget uh, who it was, um, I'd have to look back and, and maybe I'll put it in a comment on this video or something. Uh, somebody has a demonstration of how to use Ancestrano with, uh, with PHP apps like Drupal, but it, it works with other applications too. Ancestrano is a really cool project to check out for doing uh, deployments that are a lot more robust and you can have um, easier rollback capabilities and things. You can build all this stuff yourself. And, and for a lot of my projects, I actually did it myself. That was, a lot of it was before this project was even in existence, which I forget when exactly it, it came to be uh, Ancestrano. Uh, but anyway, it came into existence. It was after I created my first Midwestern Mac, uh, the, the Drupal server that I'm running on. Uh, but um, it's it's a pretty cool project, so check it out. There, there, I, I'm totally blanking on who it was that... Uh, that uh, had some presentations on using this in the real world. Um, anyway, so check that out. Uh, the other one that I'm going to look at in the, from the book is the uh, Ruby on Rails example, and I'm going to have to find that because I didn't make a note where exactly it is in here. I think it's earlier in Chapter 9. Here it is. Uh, so actually, what I'm realizing is that the Rails app is substantially the same setup that I had deploying to my own server. So instead of that, I'm going to look at the Node.js example, which is, let's see, that one is zero down, downtime multi-server deployments. This one is similar to what I just did, uh, but I'll just show how that works for a Node.js app because I have been, I have been lighter on Node.js examples. Uh, partly because of my pains and struggles that I've had with Node.js. Um, but I'll show that one really quick too, and then uh, go from there. CD, what is this? This one is in the demo Node.js. Uh, where is it? Let me look in the readme. Chapter 9. Hmm. Here we go. Dem deployments rolling. Uh, okay, this example. And this also has a Vagrant file. It's going to have four uh, Node.js servers. Oh, you know what? I, I completely blanked on it. Uh, part of the reason for showing this was to mention the serial option here. And that was, that was what enabled us to have this ability to control uh, operating on one server than the other one. So if you set serial one, it's going to operate on one server at a time. So it'll run this entire play on one server. Then when it's finished, it goes back and runs the entire play on another server. I mentioned that before I showed the playbook, but <laughs> this is actually what controls that. So if you had, let's say you had 10 servers, you could do serial five and it would deploy to five servers first and then it would uh, deploy to the next five. And also if you wanna get more into the details there and if you do have lots of servers, uh, Ansible serial. Uh, let me look at the. Let me look at the doc documentation for delegation rolling updates. Uh, so there's another setting that you would want to be able to control. Sometimes just by the act acts of nature or things, a server will just kind of go bad, and a network connection will go bad, something like that. So you can also set a max fail percentage, 
And, uh, you know, I, I usually try to be conservative with that. I'd, I'd put maybe like 10 or 20 or something like that. And if that many servers fail, then it will consider that the whole thing failed and then it will fail your playbook. If it, if more servers than that actually succeed, then it will continue running and it will run all the way through just so that you don't end up in a state where some of your servers got updates and then it failed and it stopped. Uh, because the, especially if you have, let's say, 100 servers, almost always one of those servers is going to have something go wrong. So you can have that server just go out of your mix and kind of leave it. And then, you know, if you have infrastructure as code, you might be able to just delete the server and a new one pops up in its place. Like if you're using a load balancer, if you're in Kubernetes or something. Um, otherwise, you can go in and, and, like I said earlier, fix that server and then bring it manually back into the mix. Uh, but max fail percentage and zero are the two ways you control that. Uh, let me go out of here and I'm going to go ahead and bring this environment up. Uh, clear. All right. Uh, Vagrant up. And I'll describe this playbook really quick. Uh, this one is just going to basically install Node.js and then it uses deploy uh, to run a little API, a little Node.js API, and it's using forever. I think there's better ways to do this nowadays. Back when I wrote this, Forever was the simplest way to get service, like Node.js apps running kind of in, as a service. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways to do that now. And uh, it, it calls both of those playbooks uh, the first time that you run this to install Node.js and deploy the, the API application to it. Uh, let's see here. So I'll let that go in Vagrant. And I'm going to take a quick glance at chat. Uh, someone had COVID and the after effects are lousy. I, from the few people I know that have gotten it, yeah, it, it doesn't sound like something fun to have. Just as a point of, of data for me, the last time that I had a cold, I ended up in the hospital. It's it, When you're on immunosuppressant drugs, it's not a joke to get sick at all. So I have to be very careful about uh, precautions and, you know, it, COVID could definitely wipe me out and I don't want that to happen. No jazz. Uh, da, da, da. Aman is asking about Ansible for Kubernetes. And yes, I am planning on uh, on doing a series on Kubernetes. I, I have my Turing Pi cluster series. And I, the next episode is going to be talking about benchmarking and a few other features in K3S and Kubernetes that I'm using with it. And uh, But I that in that series, I'm intentionally not going super deep into Kubernetes itself or automating Kubernetes. And there's a problem here. Oh, the role was not found. What do I got here? Oh, it's roles path roles. I probably need to install the requirements. Ansible Galaxy install dash r requirements. That should install some roles in here. There they are. Okay, and then I can say vagrant provision. Um, anyway, so I, I am planning on doing a Kubernetes. I, I haven't decided if it's going to be Kubernetes 101 or if it's going to be uh, Ansible for Kubernetes, or if it's going to be automated in Kubernetes 101. The thing is that there's a lot of different things I want to do, and I, I think uh, from from my looks around, it, the problem that I have with a lot of the Kubernetes content, while this is loading, sorry to go on some tangents today, uh, but uh, Kubernetes, draw the owl gearling guy. Uh, wait, let's see if I can find this graphic. Uh, is it on here? Yeah, uh, this is the problem with like 99% of Kubernetes content out there today. Most, like it, a lot of times you'll search for like, I'm having this problem and I want to solve it in Kubernetes. And, uh, but stepping back a little bit, sometimes Kubernetes is not the right answer for your problem. And that goes back to the complexity versus what are you trying to achieve conversation. But sometimes, you know, it, it is necessary. If you're running a pass a platform as a service, or if you're running a lot of microservices, Kubernetes can be a good option for that. Uh, and a lot of like K3S and, and managed Kubernetes can make it a lot easier. Anyways, the problem is that a lot of times when I'm doing something in Kubernetes, I run into an issue. I search for that particular thing and I find a medium.com post and the post title is like exactly what I want. And somebody says, here's how you do this. And then they give you like a little blurb that, that kind of works for kicking a, off a job or something. But it doesn't explain at all how it works. It doesn't explain why it works or why you'd want it to work that way. 
And a lot of times it just kind of ends there and they don't give you any more data or any, any further instruction for like, oh, and here's, here's the documentation to read to go further. So anyway, my intention is I want to uh, teach you how to draw the owl instead of just saying, here's a, here's a couple circles and then you can draw this beautiful owl, but I'm not gonna tell you how to do it. Uh, I wanna take you from this point to this point in a step-by-step -step fashion. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's gonna be Ansible or Kubernetes 101 or, or automating Kubernetes 101 or what, uh, but we'll get there. Let's see. Uh, Mike is asking about meta slash main.yaml for dependencies. I'm assuming you're talking about this right here. I usually don't use that at all. I usually want to be intentional about the order that I'm doing things in and a lot of my roles. Like I think my solar, my Apache solar role depends on Java being present. So I could put a dependency on my Java role and that, that's one way to do it. Uh, but I like to have some freedom and flexibility. Some server images already have Java installed, so I don't want to have to run my Java role every time that I set up solar if my server image already has Java on it. Uh, similarly, um, if you wanted to have a different method of Java installation besides the way Jeff Geerling does it, if I put a dependency on my Java role and my solar role, if you use my solar role, you have to use my Java role. And maybe my role could have a way to disable or something, but it's just kind of kludgy that way. So I like to limit dependencies wherever possible. Uh, that, you know, I, I guess that's, that's probably one reason why I'm not a Node.js developer primarily. I've, I maintain a few Node.js applications. But uh, Node.js takes the complete opposite approach where it's like, oh, I don't have to write one line of code if I add this dependency that has 7,000 lines of code. I'm going to add that dependency. It's like, no, that's, that's not the way that I operate. Uh, there are very few instances where I do use a dependency. Uh, but anyway, next week I'm going to talk about collections, and I will be talking about collection dependencies and role dependencies and the relationship to each other and some, some uh, potential risks with uh, trying to manage things that way. All right, uh, and Anna, Anatoly says, uh, why not both Kate, Kate's 101 and automation for Kate's? Uh, that could happen. I, I just have to decide which one do I want to do first because I also am trying to finish my book on Ansible for Kubernetes so that I can put it up on Amazon and get a wider audience for it. But uh, anyway, there's, there's plenty of fun things to do. We'll see which fun thing I can do next. All right, so we have this thing running and uh, I completely lost my train of thought on it. Uh, it runs these... It runs the four servers, and let's see. I don't really have anything particular that it does with them, uh, but what it's going to do is uh, this playbook. Uh, let me. Where am I now? Okay, this deploy playbook here is going to make sure it's present, uh, and it's going to use where? Wait a second. Hold on. Uh, Node.js gather facts. All right, so uh, what I, well, I don't have everything set up for it and I don't have the time to get set up for it, but what I was going to show is if I set serial two, that's similar to the other one that we were doing. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and run provision that's just gonna run the Ansible playbook without me having to type in Ansible playbook. Um, it's going to hit this deploy playbook. Actually, I will do it. Ansible uh, playbook dash I inventory playbooks deploy. Uh, and it's going to run on two servers at a time. And what I was going to show was changing an option in here. What this is doing is uh, it's actually running tests on the server. So after it deploys uh, up here, uh, if I change the app version, which I don't have the time to grab the right version and, and test it all out. Uh, but if I updated this app version and it deploys that update, if a test fails, so this is actually running the test suite against the the active application on the server that it, it could have just taken out of the load balancing loop. If that test fails, then it's going to stop at that point and I can go in and fix those servers. I don't have time to show all that example right now, um, uh, but you can find it uh, in the book on page 265 of version 122, which is probably a different page number nowadays. And that's why it's so hard to make an index for this book because I have to do it manually. Um, <clears throat> anyways, you can, you can look up that example and run it on your own and, and find that. Uh, <laughs> Captain Wasabi says a one-line dependency from something like this uh, took down the whole system, took down the whole ecosystem recently. Another reason why I don't like dependencies unless they're absolutely necessary is uh, a situation that in most 
code communities, we all know it exists. It just hasn't happened yet, and hopefully it won't. Uh, but like in the Node.js community, there was the left pad debacle, which was uh, there was a library that so many people used in the Node.js ecosystem. And I, I don't remember if the maintainer deleted it or changed it or something happened that caused, just look up left pad Node.js. And uh, basically tons of Node.js application deployments started breaking because the one dependency that's way up the chain of dependencies uh, was messed up. And a similar thing happened a few months ago, I think, with uh, Chef. Was it Chef or Puppet? I don't remember. Somebody uh, basically deleted or they, they, they wiped out one of the repositories that was a module that so many people depended on. And because of that, everybody started having their automation breaking, and it led to some outages even. So uh, the fewer dependencies, the better. And having a dependency manager that can manage them well is better. And that's why a lot of times I fight hard to try to get Ansible Galaxy to work really well and allow you to install things uh, easier. And why I recommend a lot of times, if you have a very important playbook, commit your uh, roles directory and your collections directory to your repo. But if you do that, you have to be very careful and intentional about how you do it. And also um, make sure you get ignore certain things. Uh, anyway, that's gonna be a topic I'll talk about a little bit more next week because next week I'm going to talk about Ansible collections, which is a relatively new thing in the Ansible ecosystem. Collections have been around for two releases now, since 2.8, but there have been a lot of changes. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of why collections came into existence, uh, what they're best for, uh, what, some of the, what some of the things, are, the rough edges right now, and uh, talk about how to build one and how to use one and how to submit one to Galaxy too. Uh, so anyway, uh, it was Chef somebody, somebody mentioned that had that issue. Uh, so here's the social links, and if I move over this way, you can see that that uh, the little little GitHub guy is empty. Sorry about that. I'll I'll maybe get that fixed, maybe not. Um, but please consider subscribing to the channel, following me on on uh, uh, Twitter, wherever, and supporting me on GitHub or sp uh, Patreon. And again, I wanted to mention that um, you can go back to the other video. There's a link in the Ansible for DevOps repository, or if you don't know it. Uh, Let's go back in my channel. It's the twenty or the twenty-five k open source pay it forward giveaway or something like that. Uh, if you want to enter to win that Raspberry Pi, uh, next week we'll talk about Ansible collections, and I can't think of anything else to mention. Uh, so, um, uh, oh, one other thing that I've I've noted: a lot of people have been emailing me directly asking for Ansible support. And while I would love to do that, uh, the problem is I only have so many hours in a day and I have all these decisions like whether to do Kubernetes 101 or Kubernetes Automation 101 and all these things that I mentioned. Uh, so I can't really do support. Like if you're gonna send me a, a large issue over email, I'm, I'm just not gonna be able to help you with that. But I, I often tell people, if you want to get great Ansible support, uh, go ahead and ask questions in Ansible's IRC channel, ask in the Ansible project mailing list, uh, make sure that you have done your background research, make sure that it's not something simple that you just missed or something. Um, and if you find that it's a bug in the Ansible project or a bug in one of the modules in Ansible, find the right repository on GitHub, file an issue. When you file the issue, follow the template so that it has the relevant information people would need to help you. Um, but unfortunately, I can't help everybody with all their problems. And uh, especially if you're using Windows, I am I, I've used Windows my whole life here and there, but I've never used it as my daily driver and I don't manage Windows servers, so I'm totally out of my league there. So if you have a Windows issue, please don't ask me about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't help you. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for watching today and uh, I will see you next week.